Hello and welcome to episode 134 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago, I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary singer, songwriter, and musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And on this episode, I am joined by a huge fan of the jam and Paul Weller, singer, songwriter, Nick Haywood. Now, Nick burst onto the scene in the early 80s with his band Haircut 100 and the debut album Pelican West, which has just been re-released to celebrate the 40th anniversary. In this episode of the podcast, Nick talks about his love of the jam, connections with Paul Weller from the man who signed them, Chris Parry, to legendary publisher, the late Brian Morrison, photographers Gerard Mankiewicz and Lawrence Watson, to sleeve designer Simon Halfen, and so much more. And we kick off chatting about the band's recent performance on BBC Radio 2's The Piano Room. Let's get into it. Nick Haywood, thanks for joining me. Lovely to be here, Dan. Lovely to be here. I'm so glad that you found the time in what is a really chaotic time period for you right now. I mean, before we just start recording, we were talking about this week and it's been a mad week, isn't it? It has. It's just been one. It's typical Haircut 100 week. It's got a, a Haircut 100 is like an, a, a rush of adrenaline. You know, like maximum 100%, you know, all those early Who posters and things. That's what this band has. It's just a kind of like an energy of itself. It's like sometimes I feel like it's a magic door, like a portal to a, some kind of like other adrenaline filled, cortisol filled world. And something happened yesterday which got me ready for it. I got attacked by a dog on my just taking a calm country walk. And as a dog lover, 61 years so far, I've never had that. <laughs> and it was just like typical haircut stuff. You know, I didn't sleep at all. You know, my wife and I just were like wide awake the whole night. You know, on the night where you just want to be, this was us kind of like out of nowhere land, suddenly onto the biggest gig in town on Radio 2. And we're like, oh, we're playing with an orchestra. We've never, we haven't played for 10 years. Hold on a minute. So I went on there with no sleep at all and kind of just like, right, kind of got through it somehow. Yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was emotional, really emotional as well. I mean, Les, our bass player, was in tears. Um, <laughs> Graham lost it. I lost it this morning because like, I didn't sleep. The whole day. <laughs> Les was in tears just hearing the strings because it's a bit of a story for us of the, of the kind of whole 40 years of not being, not being able to make it together. And suddenly it's just all fallen into place, like naturally, kind of organically. We just are together, never got on as well as this. It's just like we're all the, the, you know, Les Graham and I are just back almost in a feeling like we were when we lived together above a flower shop in Gloucester Road. It's just we're mates again. It's like all through the last 40 years didn't exist and suddenly the stars are aligned and it's like we're all just kind of, wow, this feels so good. Naturally. It's time that you needed, right? So you needed 40 years to get to be the band that you needed to be and you can be and all that, yeah. Yeah, it's really weird. We don't we don't understand it, but we're not questioning it because we go like, is this weird or what? You know, is this feel <laughs> right? It feel I've never felt this way so right. I think we just needed to grow up or something, obviously, and um, mature and have loads of crap stuff happen and then kind of grow and then be be able to appreciate everything, be humble. Be thankful, be grateful. I don't know what it is, and uh, and really not back and surprised by all the love for the band. I mean, it's just it was you know there was people in yesterday there the, the the head of BBC came down because he's a fan, and it's just like people who were fans then and couldn't admit to it. And going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm not going to get beaten up now. You know, I can say <laughs> I was a like, oh, fan. You know, great name that. Yeah, yeah, really good name. Cool. Yeah. But at the time, it was a bit like, you know, we, we, we launched off a cool launch pad through the NME and, and things and, and London. And, and then quite quickly, it just went girl screaming, which was a blessing in disguise of it. Most bands do have it at the beginning of their careers, kind of thing, if they're young. But we, we d- did have it. And, you know, I mean, in hindsight, we look back and kind of go, oh, God, you know, when I, when I look at the camera and think, look at, look at, sh- stuff and go, God, that, that kind of like cute look, 
oh my god that's so embarrassing you know but, um, <laughs> what, yeah, well, we all do that with old photos and the, 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 some of us don't have the thing of where they were covered all over the front of ma- magazines and newspapers and all that you know yeah but the seduction stuff that's just embarrassing you know what I mean <laughs> kind of like you know they're trying to look like James Dean and that's okay like we're cool you know like in pictures you know going around like this like we, we, we were doing but you know, all that kind of like, <laughs> stuff and all that, you know, you just kind of go. The longing look. Yeah. But you can't be too hard on yourself because you just think that's what young guys do. You know, you, they'll do anything to be attractive. You know, it's like that thing. It's just a natural thing. It's like, what can I do to meet ladies? You know, what is it that we have to do? And, um, but, you know, now it's all about the music. We did get to rehearse. For, for a day, so we get, did get to play not after 40 years. That wasn't thrown in with an orchestra that that much in the deep end, but, you know, it was still just an afternoon in a rehearsal, brilliant rehearsal studio, actually, Hive. Fantastic rehearsal studio. But it was just kind of like we started playing and it was it was lovely. It was so lovely. And I love um, this. I love the I love the passion for this. You're talking about the band like it's a new band and this is a new project, and and I get why. Like you're so excited about it. It's brilliant. And here we are, like you know, performing at the legendary Maid of Vale for goodness' sake on the BBC. Like you say, the biggest radio show in Europe, Ken Bruce on Bit Radio Two. Yeah, and that didn't happen with any kind of company. There's no company behind us. There's, this is all organic. <laughs> this is just some guy at the BBC thought I'd like to get them. They seem to be back together. Okay, yeah. I, you know, nobody <laughs> arranged it kind of thing. People have to dig this out on BBC Sounds. You can watch it as well. That's the thing. So, and we get Love Plus One, we get Fantastic Day. And these songs that we say 40 years old still sound as fresh as anything, still sound great. But also a lovely Harry Styles cover as well. It was, it goes like the Clappers, that song. What brilliant song. We started doing it immediately. We did it about five different ways. In fact, a kind of Roots dub version we really liked, but... By then, all the strings had set in place. It's, you know, it's, you got, you've got to stick to the template. But actually, we chewed it around for a bit. The Boss Nova ones really worked as well, the kind of style council one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love but to in, hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, but in the end, it was just like, well, let's just kind of like do it in its spirit, because that's why I sung the lyric Harry, because it's, you know, it's not, it's not my song, but I'm giving respect to the artist, and I'm giving respect to the people that wrote the song. And also, I felt like I was more like... Harry's dad, you know, Harry's father, or even grandfather now, sort of like, well, you know, what are you doing alone on the floor? What are you doing at home? You know, what kind of pills you're on? Come on, get up, you know. So I had to kind of build a story around it, the kind of imagination of what it is. What could I, how could I own this song a bit? And so we all did that. You know, Blair just went like the clappers as he does. It's like, okay, Blair. You know, and he was off. And and Les grooved as he does. He grooves with him. And and Graham was just suddenly, because he's, He's like more rock. He was really into the Clash. Graham was, when I first met him, he was full Clash regalia, everything, the hat, the chains everywhere and everything. Yeah, I met him outside the Wimpy Bar in, in Beckenham. You know, he was actually going out with my ex-girlfriend. But such is life then, you know, ex-girlfriend didn't mean you don't, don't talk to each other. It's just like, oh, you know, respect. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I want to take you right back to the very beginning, okay? Let's kick off on this as well with the jam, the love of the jam. So this is before you were known in the music industry, before you were you know, in the band that was in Haircut 100 and all that. But you loved the jam, didn't you? I loved them right from the beginning. They just resonated. It was like pure electricity for me. The first gig I saw them was the Croydon Greyhound. It must have been 77, probably. I'd got the album by then. The first sort of heard with them, because I, I remember just reading and seeing a picture. I think it was like the picture. I saw the picture of them playing in Carnaby Street, mar- the market near Carnaby Street. It was just like uh, they played in the square there or something. Mm-hmm. And I saw a picture of that, and I was smitten. I was always smitten by pictures there. Like I first saw the picture of Talking Heads in the same way, and they are all wearing Fred Perry's and semi-acoustic guitars. And it was just like... And they, you know, the hair was to one side kind of thing. It was just like, yeah, you know, you latch onto that as a, as somebody that likes to go, cause mods love the look, don't they? It goes to the look. And then it's, it's like the music. And if those two things go together, it's just something that happens, isn't it? In that moment. And that was what happened. And then I was working as a commercial artist and I, one of the jobs was to take a, deliver a parcel to Chris Parry oh. at Fiction Records. I was really looking forward to that one, you know. So I went there and I waited and I waited outside the office and, and then out came Chris Parry. I didn't know what he looked like, but it was he said, okay, son, come in, stick your demo on. And I thought, oh, 
<laughs> I said, I'm just delivering this parcel. It's um, the jam artwork, you know, because House of Wizard, the company I worked for then, they did sleeves as well. They used to do a Uriah Heap, the jam. Oh, what a lovely connection. Brilliant. Oh. Um, so I got to meet uh, Chris Parry there. And um, and then when the band, you know, years later, when I did get a band together, because at that point I thought I could have had a tape. Mm. You know, it was like an inspiration to start making demos, you know, start. And that's why I started going to London Bridge and, and around Elephant and along the St. Catherine's Dock that was filled with studios, eight-track studios and things. I used to go in there and we just made demos and just wanted to be a band as, as good as the, as the jam. I mean, it was all those bands. I mean, they were the benchmark. But, you know, when you're first starting out, you can't play like that. I mean, I, I just used to look and think, I can see what Paul Weller's doing, but you know, what is that with his hand? What, what is he doing? <laughs> It took me days to work that out, you know. Ah, oh, right. So he planned that. Okay, because he was always doing stuff up here and couldn't afford a Reckenbecker because even then they were quite expensive. So um got a Telecaster, I think that was the first guitar. And then Rob Stroud, who was, he wanted to be a drummer, was a junior in the art studio too. So together we just walked down to in Pan Alley and bought guitars. He bought the drum, the snare drum, I bought a guitar, and then we went back to my house and just in the linen cupboard there and just started playing music. I just resonated with the jam somehow out of all those punk bands. I, I didn't, I liked The Clash and I loved their first album. It had, it had something for me, but I think it was the songs and it was the fact that it was, because I wasn't into the Beatles then. I got into them a lot later. I discovered them, but there was um, there's elements of the Beatles in there, and there's elements of just songwriting, isn't there? There's and the, the power. That's what I really liked. I mean, those early clips. What's the one? Um, I think it's in the city. That there's an early clip still going round on online. A really early gig. It is 100 percent adrenaline, isn't it? It's just so powerful. The power in the way they move around on stage and everything. And Bruce Falkston diving so high. I mean, he still jumps up that high, doesn't he? <laughs> I think he's trying. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's still doing it like a gazelle. He's so, like, flying through the air like a gazelle. Such an amazing band. I mean, I, I really I was fixated on how level Rick Buckler's fringe was as well. It was really level right across, you know. And I tried it one day, and I just looked. I looked like an outpatient. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't suit everybody, does it? You know, you've got to go with your style of hair that you, you got, you know. <laughs> but I like the fact that you're talking about the three of them, right? This isn't the Paul Weller show. The, the jam were those three guys. And it's a really important thing. We've, and we have talked about this on the podcast, but, but for you, it was all about the three of them together. Mm. Yeah, bands, right from seeing the monkeys living, you know, living together. That was it. It was bands being a band. The myth of that and how his team's the people were on stage and made magic together. I mean, that that was it. I mean, they were the kind of three-headed thing, weren't they? They just like, wow, position one, position two, you know, right in the centre, and it's just like <clears throat> so powerful. It's like um, it's like a pitchfork. <laughs> they're like <laughs> digging around the punk atmosphere, like <laughs> they're digging into the hay, and the you know the jam with a pitchfork. So, and from that point, what did you see them often? Were they um, were there some somebody a band that you saw live a lot? Yeah, I saw them at the Marquee. Yeah, I saw them quite a few times whenever I could, just regularly whenever they were going. And, um, and I, I bumped into Paul walking down the road in Victoria. It's where the kind of, um, when you walk up to Victoria Station, there's posts that go over this, the modern bit with the shops on the, on the left by sort of like Catholic Church. And I was just walking up there because I lived at, at that particular point, my parents, who were, we had pubs and uh, they got a job in the ski club of Great Britain, which was uh, 118 Eaton Square. And they got a flat with it. So we were living in the flat in the basement. Found myself up. Punk was kicking off. And I'm just walking around Victoria and all those areas in Belgravia. Believe it or not, it wasn't as posh as it is now. I mean, it's out of the world posh now. But then it was just a place. I mean, I think Paul lived there. He had a muse house around there. I didn't know that at the time, but I was just seeing him a lot. And I was walking down. And I remember him walking towards me. And he just looked like a kind of, I mean, to, to me then, it was just, he was the a god of pop, you know, um, in that pop art sense of the word, you know, and he was walking like that. And even even then, I don't know why, but I hid. And I, was <laughs> post. I couldn't face meeting a pop star, so such a such a person, you know. <laughs> it was just like he looked so like a god walking down the, the road. The way he walks as well, he's, he was obviously really aware that he was like, you know, 
It's chewing away, yeah. <laughs> well, like, chewing know, the gum, yeah. I'm really cool, and I'm walking down Victoria, you know, and there's it's obviously a mod sort of guy that, you know, because I, I was kind of, punk was kicking off, but I was always wore hush puppies. <laughs> <laughs> All the way through punk, I was wearing hush puppies. Because originally, I used to wear cool dry shoes, and then that turned into hush puppies. Then it was then it was suede, but the cool dry jacket stayed. So there was just bits. I, I could never go fully punk. I felt like it was it was. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But there, there's, it's a deep connection because I remember my girlfriend left me for a punk. So that might have had something to do with it. There might have been a little bit like, well, you know, what do you think of him? He, the way he dresses. I mean, it, punk is not cool the way it is. It's dress. It's, you dress like a bit stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, like, probably probably that. And I was into art school, bands like Death School and things, and bands that dressed a bit jazz as well. I liked that. So you had this love of the visual, and you mentioned working in commercial art, graphic design, that type of thing, right? But then this music comes into your life, and you mentioned about the, the recording in all these little studios, and you and your mate getting a band together. But before we get to Haircut 100, you went through quite a lot of name changes, didn't you? Didn't you go through quite a lot before you settled on that one? Yeah, you know, um, I don't think you're allowed to do that these days, because you have to get a web domain going. And <laughs> Yeah, you're right, yeah. I mean, I still come up with names now and buy the web name, just, just to sort of like have it, just because I I think I still think I'm going to be starting bands, you know. <laughs> it's just like I don't know. It can still the sort of dream is to have a band about seven or eight or maybe ten or twelve on the go somehow. Maybe that's what I can do here. It's just like <laughs> no, I don't want to be in them. That's the thing, though. It's you just um, want to you just want to own the own the rights. I, I just like well, it's for them. I mean, I'd get the band for them because I even now I, I know bands and I go, listen, guys, you know, you got to have a great name. That name is not good, what you've got. You know, the, the, everything's good, but it's a little adjustment. You're only a few little adjustments about being away from the jam. Yeah. <laughs> 100. You know, there are, there are bands with really good names that just, I mean, you know, like Wet Leg, it gets you noticed. It's like yeah. that thing you start saying, why? But if you've got a, a band name like The Something, it just kind of, Okay, or it's a, a named after you personally. It's like okay, that's good, but you know, there's a story, and you know, there's something mythological about bands with, with really good names as well, and snappy names, and you know, I remember the it was it meant a lot that the Jam were called the Jam. It's a brilliant name, and it writes so well. The artwork around it, they you know, sprayed on the wall. I mean, I've been to the exhibition three times now, and it's just every time you go to the, the tiles. And you see that, that's a really strong look, isn't it? And logo, the jam, shh, shh, you know. For hours I used to sit there drawing that, you know. <laughs> so, you know, when you start a band, you just think, well, there's no way I would have a crap name. It's good. So you have, you go through your crap names a lot. You know, we went through many crap names. Yeah, what did we have? So we had rugby, the boat party was one, I think. We played with Wellington Waterloo under rugby. You know, I thought rugby was a good name. <laughs> I, did, actually. I, I thought it was, you know. Captain Pennyworth, that was another one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Napkin Man, um, that was great. <laughs> I didn't know that one, Napkin Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crispy Cereals. See, all, all good crap names going nowhere. Yeah. We land on Haircut 100, and I mean, this thing goes massive, huge sales, some amazing singles. Like I say, we're like 40 years on, and these things still stand up when we talk about you know, Nobody's Fall and Favourite Shirts and this debut album. We'll talk, and we'll talk more about that debut album in a second as well, because there is a big celebration this year with that album. Massive, massive sales. You mentioned about it being chaotic the last week or so. I mean, how chaotic was that at the time? I mean, it must have been hugely exciting, but pretty intense, I would imagine. Yeah, it was, and I, you know, I'd sat and... But I had stood, I'd pogoed, I'd done stuff in the audience as a uh, watching and mythologizing it and stuff. And it was the dream standing in the audience of the Greyhounds, like looking at the jam and just, you know, sweating as they did. I thought I want to be on stage sweating like that and then go forward many years and it's happening to you. You know, you're learning about all the things that also go beyond them. You know, you, you always think it's what's happening is just happening and nobody else has been through this. But, you know, as you get older, you realise that most bands go through the same stuff, the same pitfalls, same things they've got to work on. And we went through them all. You know, the manager that sort of sets you up and then walks off with all the, the money from the merchandising, does a runner. You know, you you go through the, all that stuff of uh, everybody trying to manage the band and then 
same old stuff, the jealousies in the band that starts to happen, all the in- insecurities, the mat- immaturity. I went through kind of not being able to handle the level of fame. I mean, I just, I, I know I wanted it. You know, I sat, this time I had sat and watched Stardust, you know, you know, watching that as a kid going, wow. But then when it does happen, you dream about it. But when it does happen, it's more real and you actually have to deal with it in real time. And all the emotions, and you're you're not equipped to deal with it. Well, some people are, some people aren't. But it went totally to our heads. We we thought we understood it. Everything was good, but only in hindsight we just went, "Well, what a pig's ear of that!" You know what <laughs> we made. You know, I wonder if now that also there are more support networks in place, and people like, do you know what I mean? Like the management would be able to coach a Harry Styles or a um, Ed Sheeran on that level of fame, and because you you've got all that knowledge now. But yeah. back then people were winging it, weren't they? You know, you were kind of all making up as you went along, really. So you didn't have that kind of mechanism where you could support young artists in that way. No, no, it's really together now, actually. I mean, I, I still think that rock and roll stuff does happen and there are not such great people out there taking advantage of naive people in the, you know, there's still that stuff that goes on. But generally, I think it's got better and better. It's like everything's got better that way, you know. As it gets better, it gets worse. And as it gets worse, it gets better sometimes, you know, because it takes away all that randomness. I mean, I did an interview the other day and I, I said jokingly, which is always kind of something said in jest, but I said, you know, maybe if we hadn't have been so, if some, a free for all and sort of ripped off, if you like, for one of a better description, if you hadn't, if it hadn't have been like that, maybe we wouldn't have happened because we had to be so open and for everything to take off you've got to sort of like not be in control it's just that we didn't have that point where it was suddenly you know we didn't have like john the jams manager you know we didn't have that we didn't have that strong guidance so yes it went like that and it's a bit like a i don't know an airplane yeah but you know if the crew don't know how to fly this plane yeah, it's soon going to come crashing down, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, even a boat, a ship doesn't get too far outside of the harbour, even if it, even if it, even if it wants to go around the world. There are a few lovely little Weller connections I wanted to link in on, right? So, and I mentioned on Twitter that we were chatting, and lots of people have got in touch with questions. So I must get through some of these as well. So, AK on Twitter said, "Ask him who thought up the early Haircut 100 image: chunky jumpers tucked into pantaloons." Now, I think there's a link to the jam around some of this stuff as well, in terms of the visual element of the band. Was it a Brian Morrison? Wasn't there a story with Brian? It was he, he was. Links with yeah. you and also with the jam, right? Yeah, um, he. Um, it, it's, that's that's another thing, you know. It was those sort of pinch me moments, kind of like growing up, loving the jam, having this sort of Chris Parry connection, who then did actually what he came to one of the early gigs. So we could have signed to Fiction, but it was actually Arista that we went with because of the, also the love of the beat, how their pop record sounded, and so crisp and, and things, and a kind of thing of they had the monkeys, you know, a, a kind of thing. But um, it could have been. Um, sorry, I've, I've went off and I started thinking of. Um, <laughs> no, I love it. The memories all going back. I think it's because that I didn't sleep. <laughs> I was mentioning about Brian Morrison because he was yeah, he Brian was Morrison. he was your publisher as well, wasn't it? Yeah, Brian Morrison. He was, and that was a, a pinch me moment because you know the first publisher that gets involved is the guy that signed the Jam, and it's kind of like, oh my god, the Jam. He said, when I talked to Brian, he said, yeah, I just, he had a big cigar kind of thing. He was a real white boy, large than life character, big furry coat, flew a helicopter, <laughs> you know, sort of getaway jag kind of thing, or Aston Martin with his partner, Dick, you know, Dick Leahy. Bless him, he's not with us now. He said, I just wanted uh, Paul Weller, you, and George Michael. So it was a huge in that way. Another thing is that that connection. And then I remember Bruce being on Arista for a while, but actually after the jam as well. That's right. As a solo artist, wasn't he? Yeah. So you're yeah. label mates. Yeah, because he was with uh, Brian as well. So I got to meet Bruce a bit. But Bruce is really shy. I mean, I played with From the Jam a few times, and he's really shy. You know, you think somebody, I mean, I kind of, you know, again, being back at the Greyhound, you think that gazelle up there is really confident, that confident gazelle. He, it's like Penelope Pitstop. Surely Penelope Pitstop is not is not quiet. And then you meet Penelope, and it's just like, you know, it's very quiet, very private. It's just, it's a strange one. What was Brian's involvement in the image? Did he have something to do with how you looked? Was that a top of the pops thing or something? Yeah, he came down to the to the top of the pops studio for the first for the run through, and he was watching the run through, and it was freezing in there, absolutely freezing. So we just had our jumpers on, the jumpers tied around the lips. We weren't going to wear that. We we're going to just I think it was like we were into, at that particular point, I was going to wear full polo gear and 
everyone was else was going to wear like um, Converse because that's what we were we were into. And we're, Les wanted to wear a bit more smart because he used to go for kind of distinguished gent kind of look because he really liked film stars, I think. He's got a bit of a dashing film star suave look going even today. It's just like, you know, Les, you look really suave, if you don't mind me saying, you know, <laughs> sophisticated. He's just got that uh, white wear band. He's, he's got a cool dress sense, Les. He can make Zara look good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so that's what we're doing. And Brian said, uh, boys, keep the jumpers on. So we did. We listened to our publisher, you know, kept the jumpers on. And that was another one of those happy accidents, like a kind of organic thing. It went crazy because of wearing jumpers. (laughs) Why not? Now, there's some other little connections we're going to talk about as well, right? So the album cover, that album cover, you were involved, obviously, the commercial artistry of you was involved heavily in the design of that. But I'm right in thinking Gerard Mankiewicz was the photographer. The modern world, the jam photo, and, and Gerard's been on the podcast as well, but there's a little jam connection there. Was that obvious? Did you pick it from that reason or is it just happy coincidence? Happy coincidence again and one of the pinch me kind of stuff that was happening one after the other, you know. Um, and also you're starting to develop this thing where you... you pinch me and you can't believe it's happening but also you get a feeling of am i worthy of this because you feel like a you know you say i'm a fraud that imposter syndrome type yeah. thing really yeah you, you, it's, um, i think everybody well no, not everybody i can't speak for everybody but uh, you come across it so much just in anything i think it's anybody as well that is dealing with having success there's a part of you that thinks why me um in a way um, maybe it's connected closely to survivors of accidents. <laughs> you know, like, you know, they have that moment where they feel guilty about surviving, but it's something psychologically going on there where you, you know, cause you don't want to, um, you don't want to feel like that, but obviously, but it is actually happening. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with a running commentary when here you are at an award ceremony and you're, you're chatting and you're going up and you see Sting coming towards you? You know, and it's just like, I mean, it wasn't that long before I was diving out the way of Paul Weller walking down the street. <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't even known. It was just like, what on earth am I doing diving out the way? What is this? This is strange. Why am I diving? What am I, you know, and then you got kind of Sting coming towards you and he comes over and goes, yo, you know, he didn't, but uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I can't remember what he said. <laughs> but. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's just a bit like, and you're talking to them going, there's a part of you that's going, you you know, you... Yeah, you shouldn't be here. This is not, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I guess then it also plays into maybe, some, sometimes that visualises itself to that destructiveness, and maybe that's what, the, when the band implodes, and we'll talk about oh, that. Oh, all that, time. yeah. And I think we're all dealing with that. You're self-destructing all the time, and I think nowadays they, they even recognise it, and they have managers to help artists not self-sabotage. You know, you see it in bands now, you know, there are people in bands that are, you know, you can see them that some of them are just at it and others just born to being social butterflies. Mm-hmm. They're taken to it like a duck to water. You know, but you look at look at even Harry Styles getting an award and sort of there he gets a Grammy and he goes, you know, people like me shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. what it was meaning. He wasn't saying, because he didn't probably obviously see himself as white, privileged, wealthy bloke. He just says people like me from a boy band shouldn't be getting... And you know, an award like this, this is for Prince or something. So even then, he's probably got that at that level. He's got that imposter syndrome where he's thinking, you know, people like me. And I mean, it's 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 that thing of insecurity. You know, I was probably standing there with Sting, going, having grown up with him, thinking, well, you're in Quadrophenia, you're the face. You know, you are that guy. Look at you. You know, look at the you're Sting. For God's sake, you know, I'm some oik from Beckenham. What am I, doing? <laughs> I, I just know G, G minor, D, C, F, maybe. You know. Few others, and I've fit them around and made pop songs, and I've looked at Paul Weller going. Nah, 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 nah. I, that's the thing. I'm not a jazz, but I don't know. So you've got that, which is kind of ego, really, egocentric and insecurity, because you, you can learn. You can learn if you want to learn that stuff, and the better you get, the more confident you get in in certain areas. And and anyway, it's not a competition. It's better to be your best self. But I didn't know that then. If I got that inter- you know, interrogation, it feels like now from myself, because no one else, it's you, the inner voice, 
And now I just laugh at it and say, you know, because I still get it sometimes on an aircraft, you know, it's going to crash. It's like, that's, I just mark it, unhelpful thoughts. Yeah, you're able to manage it and stuff. I get that, it's totally. Now look, there's a few other well other things I need to talk about, right? Well, let's talk about Love Plus One, okay? So the lyric, where does it go from here? Is it down to the lake I fear? Hmm. Didn't Mr. Weller have an issue with that? Did he? Oh, I heard this. I thought he took you to task for that lyric I heard. Um, well, he was always taking me to task for something. You know, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't like my boots at one point. Well, what you wearing? Oh, the heel is too high. You know, we're in, in the Legends, I think it was. And I must say he was in a really – he was a star council. He has some early days there. It was probably about 83 or something. And he had some really cool shoes on. They were nice and flat. And I think I was wearing a bit of a high heel. And he didn't like that. You know, I think it, it was – he saw me as, you know, somebody that should be cooler than that. You know, what are you doing <laughs> in those high heels? And I must say, I did agree with him. You know, there's that thing I did look like, like down. And I thought, well, I'm not actually as tall as you, Paul. Uh, you can get away with that. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly going through a stage where I want to be taller, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Fitzgibbon on Twitter said, I saw a secret style council gig under the alias The Party Chambers Group at the Shaw Theatre in London. Nick was there with Paul Weller in the bar, right next to us all before the gig. Terence Trent Darby supported the style council. Kamel Hines' band played the last set. Do you remember that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, that was another thing. I got on really well with Paul. We used to rib each other. Um, but it was out of respect. When Les and I did a, we went on Gary Crowley's show and did an impersonation of Paul on the front of the NME. What, what's all that about then? With your lots of paint on and hardly any clothes on. What's all that about, Paul? And uh, it's like that thing of it was reverence. It's that thing when you love someone so much, you feel as though you you can. You, because somebody that doesn't care, they're not on their radar. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, when you love a band or you, when you love artists and stuff, you support them in that way. That, that ribbing goes hand in hand, doesn't it? It's a kind of English thing, maybe, or something. Ribbing each other is about being part of mates, isn't it? And now, I, you know, I know Nicky Weller and I have a fondness for the family. And, you know, I do some charity stuff with Nicky and things. And, you know, I would drop anything to do sort of like something to do with that. And that respect there. Yeah, I gather the well, I think it's also a bit of a Weller trait, the kind of piss taking and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. if, if, if they're taking the piss out of you, you're, you're on good ground, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I hang out all the time and I'm, I'm still a bit good friends with Simon Halfen, who did most of the, you know, sleeves and things and stuff. So, so I just had, um, you just end up meeting, you know, of course I'd end up working with Simon, you know, it's a, a group of people, you know, when you meet Paolo Hewitt for the first time, it's a bit like his reputation comes with him. It's just like, wow, you know. It's Paolo Hewitt, the bag, the whole thing. Suddenly, zoop, and you go, yeah, you know, it's the game. It's, <laughs> you know, let's drink some cappuccino. Let's, let's do it now, you know. <laughs> I love the fact that you're, you're, that's all coming across of you being a really big fan as well, but being part of this world, I, I kind of understand the idea of this, like you thinking you don't deserve to be part of it. Sean Farrell actually mentioned about the, well, he called it slagging off, I think, but let's call it this rivalry and this kind of Mickey taking or whatever. But apparently there was one bit, I don't know if you remember this, Paul said he'd like to be in one of your videos sitting on a tractor or eating a bar of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> He said, did, did any of this stuff ever bother you? And when did you bury the hatchet? But it sounded like actually this is all just kind of fun. Oh, it, was a, right. it was a lovely ribbon between each other. Yeah. Cause <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I even just uh, not, not so long ago, it must've been about five years ago. I was just walking down the street. It was summer. It was now around the Edgware road. I'm just crossing the road and Minnie pulls up to turn out and it was Paul. Window comes down. Oi! You know, what you doing here? You know, <laughs> kind of thing. And we hadn't seen each other for, must have been about 10 years or something like that, maybe longer. And, and it was just a, a lovely feeling. It was just, you know, just lovely, just nice. And, uh, and we, you know, we send our regards to each other via Nikki and things. And it's just, um, it's really good. It's just, uh, he, yeah, he knows I love the band. I mean, it's, you know, and he knows I love him as a songwriter. I mean, he's brilliant. But, you know, I respect everyone in that band because, you know, once you fall in love with a band, that's it. I feel it's like your loyalty to them as a band and a brand. You know, I'll be a jam fan until I, the day I die. You know, it's just kind of I'll keep going to the exhibitions, whatever they, whatever the next one is, because it seems like there's like a load of stuff probably that we haven't seen. And it's just there's more stuff to come on and I'll always want to see it. Yeah, I love seeing all that. I mean, the, what Nikki does with those exhibitions is incredible. 
Getting proper mental health care can help you feel more like you. That's why Cerebral offers convenient access to online mental health services, including therapy and medication management. Cerebral's diverse clinician team can help with anxiety, insomnia, relationship issues, workplace stress, and more. You can schedule and communicate with your care team through Cerebral's mobile app and attend your sessions from the comfort of your own home. Get started with or without insurance. Plus, you can use your FSA or HSA. Start your first month for 50% off at Cerebral.com slash ACAST. But you also love doing a bit of a jam cover version on occasion on stage. So I know Pretty Green's been in the set list occasionally. But... Yeah, and Sounds from the Street is one of my favourite songs. Yeah, quite a few people have mentioned that, actually, of you seeing you do that. And um, Captain Stack said your live TV performance of that song has always been one of his absolute favourite jam covers ever. Oh, wow. And he also said, here's a good question, actually. He said, is there a song of yours that you'd like to be interpreted by Paul in his own way? A well uh, version of one of yours. By the way, that thing with the tractor still could happen. <laughs> uh, you know, the band is back and Paul is still here we're all still here you know and I think he would suit being a farmer on a tractor more now than ever eating the bar of chocolate the flag, yeah. chocolate flake yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon Paul would play one of your songs is there a, a song of yours that you'd love it to hear him do a version he's of he's tricky you know I mean getting him to do anything you know I'm not sure he would maybe if he mellows out a bit um, <laughs> Even more. I mean, he's getting more mellow and more yellow as the years go on. He's a. I mean, I've known people that have, that knew him as well. A friend, my friend Lisa and Steve out out in LA, and she she worked on K Rock and stuff, and known him years. And when they met, you know, Paul came over and just picked her up and almost threw her in the air. Lisa, whoa, you know. I mean, he's just become more and more like a loving thing and loving, embracing thing. I mean, he's just done everything so beautifully. I think so so well. His uh, tenacity, his attention to just the love of music, and he just gets out there, gets on tour, and goes and does it. There's a clear template every year, isn't it? I'm touring, I'm doing another record, I've got the barn, we make music, Steve Craddock's here, he keeps writing these brilliant songs, and it keeps sounding great, and every once in a while you'll just go like, ah, oh, that's, oh, that's brilliant, that's a really good one. And it, it's very simple, he's just... You know, he's just, I'm a songwriter. I love a band. I love playing music and I love touring. So that's what I do. And the music business has changed, going through all this stuff around him, but he's still been just doing that one thing. That's, I think having John there at the beginning really helped guide him through the, the tricky part of your career, you know, because he's now so up and running that really it's just, I don't think he's sort of like need management, if you like. He's so aware of what his appeal is and what he needs to do. And what he doesn't want to do. I've always really admired the fact that he, he knows what he doesn't want to do. It's harder sometimes people pleasing. You know, I'd love to be like Paul in that way, uncompromising like that. And, but if you come from another another place, sometimes being amenable can be a downfall and being, you know, pleasing people in that way. So not everybody's born that way, but I I, I admire that in, in him. But, you know, you find that through, I had to find that through learning, really. I like that about Noel Gallagher as well. He's uncompromising. You know, there's a fine line between that and then being stubborn, you know, not being open and open to stuff. I mean, you know, had I been so much like that, we wouldn't know, I wouldn't be feeling the joy that I'm feeling now of being in what I consider to be the best, best band in the world. You know, I've got that feeling. I've got that feeling now to be in the best band in the world. I mean, it's like we're in, in there and just the love in the room. And to get that at 61, to be in love with your band, feel and know that you're, you're the best band at that age, it's like a, the best thing. Let's talk about Pelican West, Haircut 100's debut album and the 40th anniversary. And it was that anniversary that brought about this reissue. And through doing this podcast, I've got back into vinyl again. Like, And so many people are back into the vinyl again, right? Mm. And I made a little pact with myself that when people were on the podcast, I'd start building up the vinyl with the people and, and kind of build up a bit of a collection for my kids as well, right? So so the fact that we're back with Pelican West reissued, back on vinyl with, I, mean, I don't know how many discs this is, we're going to say the amount of stuff on there is incredible. And this wonderful beautiful 40th anniversary celebration edition is out right now. It's just been released. And the fact that people are re-embracing this wonderful album, but we're also getting the B-sides, remixes, rarities, all this stuff. I'm guessing initially that was just the project to reissue the album. Then suddenly we've got a live date coming up in the summer where the Radio 2 stuff, there's record store day stuff coming. It's building, building, building. And is it now, is the band back together? It's like, this is now a thing. 
Yeah. Again, that's we, that wasn't planned. It, it wasn't planned. We obviously we knew that there was a you know the fortieth year is coming up. So we all obviously just knew, and it's it's that thing of it's it's coming up. And Demon, who brilliant, brilliant to work with. Everyone there, Julian, Ben, fantastic, and Daryl S. Easley has put it together. Esla, I can't I can never. I, I, I've got to have a word with Daryl about that. <laughs> it's like I keep going from one to another. It's like I'm playing ping pong with his surname, <laughs> Easley Esla. You know, I've got to have a sit down and chat about that. You know, because he's he's putting this whole thing together, and he, through his love. So I think the strong, the foundations are strong here because it's the love of. Pelican West. It's the love of Haircut 100. So I think that's that love is definitely lifting it now. I was just backstage at one of these uh, Let's Rock gig, chatting to somebody who, because Kilimanjaro had just taken over Let's Rock, who are pr- promoters. They just bought it and um, talking to Joff. I said, if 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 Haircut played a gig, where would you where would you put it on? And he went, Ah, oh, Shippers Bush Empire. That'd be a really good place. I said, Ah, oh, okay. Well, see see what happens. I said, Well. Um, I said, actually, do you think just do it? He said, um, well, if you're serious about it. So and I thought, oh, God, I've got to talk to everyone. <laughs> oh, God, you know, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if, you know, oh. Um, but I just said, yes. I just said, like, go for it. But then he left. And then it was just left there. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that won't happen then. Oh, that's true. But that's okay. It's not meant to happen. And then Steve from Kilimanjaro said, oh, you, you up for that? Yeah, haircut gig, and and by then you know things would sort of I think Demon Records had put some more together, and I just said yes, go for it. I thought, oh god, I said I, I have no idea whether anybody's interested in it, but it's going to happen. I just I've got the faith in it. And he went, well, it's going to cost me to hire the place. It's going to cost you know. I like, just do it, just do it. Okay, I, I thought to myself, I will pay for this if nothing happens, and so started communicating, did some interviews with each other and stuff like that. And uh, none of us knew whether it's still, it's just, we're talking about the past and the reverence and it's it's just nice to have this thing happening. And, you know, because you've got all your your stuff and, you know, different levels in your life where you're at and things. Last I'd heard, Phil was completely retired from music. So, you know, you just assume, oh, okay, nobody's going to be wanting to get on stage so much. But, yeah, you never know. You know, there's modern things today, modern techniques, you know, you can... You can do anything on stage now. You can be a hologram, you know. You, I was going to say, we can turn him into an avatar, you right? Can, uh, you, can, you can do that, but it's just whether you're ready or up for it. So it got to the point where we were emailing each other and, and stuff, and uh, we didn't get reply about the gig from a couple of guys. And I said, let's have a meeting, bring everything up to date. We can just bring it all up to date and see whether there's any kind of like future. And it was funny because... Um, couple didn't turn up to the didn't reply about the gig and turn up to it to the meeting but you know les came all the way from spain graham drove up from cornwall and blair came over from chiswick right well, actually blair wasn't there at the initial thing but you know he was just like i'm in Give me, you know the sticks blair and i are really close kind of thing so and i guess there's an element where without them it's not the band right les and graham i mean it was our, our dream haircut 100 you know we sat around the coffee table every friday to get another band name together to go to the three tons pub in beckenham to try it out on our mates we all got chucked by our girlfriends in the same week we rehearsed together in the linen cupboard we lived above a flower shop in gloucester road together we lived and breathed the dream of haircut 100 it was our band we are the founding fathers of the band it was us living our dream so without that the three-headed jam pitchfork you know it's like the, it doesn't work i mean as soon as that was separated originally that was the split in the band because that was the strong prong <laughs> and so once the strong prong was was back it was like you know like, we're on here i can we feel the love you know it's like you do the strong promise <laughs> turn it around it's like this you know <laughs> or whatever whatever that hard thing that people do so that's it and and the love is there like it's never been before it was, well there was love there before but it was young love i mean sometimes reuni- reunions don't don't work so well as we've all found out, you know, on Facebook, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, there was a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not waste anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, not not all of it works. Not all, you know, there were six of us, so it's not going to work. But, it, you know, didn't make the first bit, you know, 
I think a couple of guys wanted to you know, just keep it, the issues in the past and with them and obviously not want to bring it up to date. So that's fine. That's, you know, you've got to respect their decision. But that meeting was fantastic and it's been lovely since. So the, yes, there is a past and everybody was part of that past to make it happen. But, you know, not everybody wants to be, is ready to be future, you know. Well, look, this, and that gig goes on sale 12th of May, Shepherd's Bush Empire and just sold out like that, right? It's like done. <laughs> I mean, that was another surprise. It took the, the promoters by surprise, you know, because it was a bit like, because I said, wouldn't it be great if we could do a tour like straight away? And I was really enthusiastic, like, uh, now let's see how the, the gig goes at Shepherd's Bush, but it's sold out. So, which is, it, that didn't happen when we sort of had a, a, the last attempt we did to kind of get all get together. This is right, though. It's just, we just know it's right. I mean, we've already agreed this is for life now. This is, we're going to grow old together, you know, as mates, even if we have a cafe. it's gonna be um we're gonna be going to each other's funerals well look i mean we've not even touched on the solo stuff so you're gonna is that are we putting the solo thing on hold for a little bit while we're back with the band or is it kind of actually the band is always together now so it's just it's just back so we do concepts jazz solo albums and i do jazz solo pop whatever it is it's just like the band is always together it will exist at the same time we can all do our solo thing so and that's just the fact that I love writing songs and hey I might have other bands you know we all might have other bands you know who knows you know it's just uh, but Haircut 100 is back (laughs) <laughs> good. one of the things that came up in research don't know if you can confirm for me obviously you mentioned the style council earlier on and loving that band as well but mr mick talbot this came up in research boogie box high jive talking so it's never been confirmed on anything but it was george michael mick talbot rumored and you can you clear this up yeah i played guitar on that <laughs> you did no and that is george singing and mick talbot in the room yeah it was it was we we did we made it a solid bond. How did that come about? Just phone. I think it was Simon Halfen for me. You know, he was saying to do with it, and it was um, George's cousin, I think, as well, was involved in it. I went along, got I I played and never got paid. <laughs> <laughs> never earned a penny out of that thing. Then it got to number one, didn't it? Yeah, I, another number one I played on, and oh well, there you Bugger go. All. Oh man, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. And of course, in the pop history thing, and at the time I was thinking, yeah, I wonder if you know, I wonder what happened to that. <laughs> but that, it was just a nice rock and roll thing to do. One of my favourite songs, Jive Talking. Yeah, great. Oh, I love that. Oh, I'm glad we cleared that up. Now, one other thing I came across in research, which I haven't managed to find anywhere else, this may be complete nonsense, but it said that you toured with Paul in support of your one of your solo albums, 1993. From Monday to Sunday was the album. It said you were on tour with Paul, but is that true? Is that right? No, I remember that. If it I was. thought, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, it was yeah. you- I did play with Paul in New York. Uh, it was Teenage Fan Club, Catherine Will, myself and Paul in a tiny little club in Buffalo, like a punk club. Paul had flown in in Concord, which I, I was ribbing ab- about. And I was saying, you flew Concord to be here. <laughs> <laughs> in this like, club in the middle of nowhere, upstate New York. I was going, that's cool. Paul. You know, the, yeah, early 90s, about 93. So we wanted to do a song and he, he wanted to do, um, he suggested That's Entertainment. But I just didn't know it off the top of my head like that. Of course, I knew the song, you know, and in love with the song. But it just, I thought, oh, God. And, you know, I'm not great at just, like, going and learning it. You know, there wasn't phones around to Google the lyrics or this or that. This was backstage kind of thing. So we did Dr. Robert that we both knew together, Beatles. And I had this thing where it was like, there we were with our acoustics, because it was a bit of an acoustic gig, playing along like that. You know, going, ring my bell, I said, you call Dr. Robert. And the mic was slowly going down like this. <laughs> and lower and lower. But I thought, I'm singing with fucking Paul Weller. <laughs> I'm not going to, this the mic stand is not going to fuck up this period. Like, I was, in the end, it was just like I disappeared. You know, <laughs> I think it was like, you know, hi, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was it. It was, um, my magic moment was ruined by the, the mic stand, but it was it wasn't a moment, and uh, I got to play with Paul, so I have done it. You know, I've I've gigged with him for three minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been on stage with Bruce. Yeah, I played in Paul's position. Oh yeah, this was on stage with Russell Hastings and Bruce Foxton from the Jam. Yeah, I can see how Russell puts. I don't know how he puts. He mentally gets his head around this. He had to turn around and see Bruce Foxton. It's a kind of like. 
it was a, that was a moment that, you know, to be, you know, to think about it, like to be a kid in Plimsolls, you know, and looking up at, at the jam at the Croydon Greyhound and wanting to be there, you know, so, so much like, wow, the reverence of it. And then many years later to be on stage, I think it was like an arena as well in Manchester or Liverpool. No, it was, was it Liverpool? Yes, it was the Liverpool Echo, Echo, wasn't it? Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Oh, big, big place as well. You know, in front of all those jam fans. And it's like, it's hard because I'm a jam fan, but, you know, there was probably somebody in quite a few people in the audience going, I'm not happy with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not happy with this. But, you know, this is the thing is the respect to the band and the songs. That's what I was there for. Badly Drawing Boy, the same. You know, we were all there to just sing these classics. I mean, he did English Rose, I think, beautifully. You know? That was his celebration of the jam, the concert at the end of the um, exhibition up in Liverpool, wasn't it? That was 2016, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, yeah. So it was just a... God, I mean, I'm in, I'm in that position. Oh my God, it's like amazing. <laughs> I thought I jumped on stage with From the Jam, a, a, a Let's Rock kind of thing. It was summer, and it was, you know, they're on, they're on stage, and they're absolutely brilliant. And I just jumped on. Really weird. I got taken over by the whole like essence of punk. <laughs> Did you go properly with it? Mike, like Iggy Pop, and it was just a bit of a moment. And I got a bit aggressive with the mic stand. I was like flinging it in the end, and it was like fell over. First time in my career I've ever thrown a mic stand over. You know, it's like I was overwhelmed by the whole spirit of punk. <laughs> Ripping your top off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Iggy, Iggy pop style, yeah. Come on, you Sorry. <laughs> he's really abusive to his audience, isn't he, Iggy Pop? He really, yeah, yeah. In a fond way. We're back to that fondness, you know? He loves his audience so much. They love him that they don't mind being sworn at. <laughs> yeah, people are paying to be sworn at. Yeah, so. I mean, I went to see him in, in Japan, I think, and it, it was uh, the night before we were playing at this place, and so he said, do you want to come and see Iggy Pop? And I was like, yeah. Went there, and, and I was shocked. It was like, he came on stage and said, you, you know, it was like, and they were going, yeah. You know, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought like, no, no. hold on, there's this guy up on stage calling me a wanker. It's just like, <laughs> I want to also mention Woodland Echoes before we go. So this was, I mean, a little while back, but your most recent solo album, because it's just beautiful. It's just oh, a stunning piece of work, man. Honestly, it's so uplifting. And, it, and it's not lovely listening to it this time of year, right? So we're in winter at the minute. It's cold. It's horrible. But you listen to it and it just screams sunshine out of you. And it's just, oh. uh, it's a lovely, lovely thing, man. But that took a while to put together, didn't it? It's not easy making a record these days like it was back in the day. No, no, there was no budget for it. So I was, you know, paying for it as I, I went so it was a bit like okay there's some money and and then it wasn't that kind of okay there's some money so go in with you know top class studio with a there wasn't a producer and and things so it was came together by happy accidents anyway and it was lovely to work with my son who was helping out with that so it's probably why it's so sunshiny because you're working with your son it's like yeah the sun is out also going up to see my wife's parents who live in Tampa and then Florida. And then from Florida, we went down to see my mate who moved to Key West, right at the tip of America, you know, yeah. 90 miles from Cuba. My friend Ian Shaw, who'd, who'd I'd done all the early sort of demos with and Kite, a song called Kite, I did the recording with him for that. And it had a bit of something magical about it. And that ended up being the record. Um, recorded that there in a basement in Shoals Road in Fulham. And it was moss. It was just so damp down there, you know, and he was down there for years. And then he moves to Key West and to build his houseboat. And he's living on a boat there. And he has a little studio down there. So we ended up going down to see him. And it was that thing of, okay, we're here. Why don't we record? Go back to what we know, do it. And that's when I did this song called Mountain Top. On oh, I love that. That's a, that's, a, that's a lovely song, man. Ah, well, it's kind of weird kind of style for me because I've never done that kind of rhythm or anything. And to be on sea level and write a song about being high on a mountain top uh, was strange. But it was, I was kind of thinking of um, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. When he, the, when the love, he discovers love. When Robert Donut, Donut discovers love calling on a mountain top. Right, yeah, yeah. It's that thing, whoa, whoa, through the mist and they get lost, don't they? And it's just, and that film really meant something to me. Yes, I'd remembered it from being younger and, you know, Sunday afternoon, parents are out, goodbye Mr. Chips is on the telly and you're watching it and it's something to watch because, you know, it's raining or something like that. But now it, was, it, it became a film, it resonated with me because when my parents died, 
I couldn't I couldn't get my head around it at all. I I thought I was grieving properly, but I wasn't. I couldn't cry and I didn't know why and didn't cry for a year and then it got to two years and um I started getting ill and then I watched Goodbye Mr. Chips and I couldn't stop bawling my at every moment. It was just getting to me. This this film, this whole black and white film with Robert Donut was working and I couldn't it wasn't like I could be in denial of this film and say, Oh no, you know. But when you know when the straw breaks, the camel's back. Yeah. Finally, go and then it was that was it. Niagara Falls, kind of, and uh, so this song is a I can hold dear to did I feel like I'm even just talking about it. It was a brilliant, brilliant moment, and um, so that film meant a lot. So that's what I'm in love on a mountain top is a kind of the celebration of life because you discover it via letting go. Mm. You know, it's what you let go of. And even look at that with haircut, you know, we, we all let go. I mean, men, Les said, I just let it all go, Nick. And, and you can tell because meeting Les, when somebody's let it all go and you meet, your issues have gone. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not relevant, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. And even if it is relevant and you can talk about it over a drink or something or other at some point, it doesn't matter. Actual genuine issue. You can still get on with stuff. But it's just there. It's not a, It's not the block. It's not a block. It's not the reason you're really angry or not doing something. You know, that fist, when it's kind of like just more like a, you know, a wave. <laughs> it's not such a fist anymore, is it? You know? <laughs> oh, man, you, you're getting me going now, Nick, honestly. <laughs> I have to ask you one question, one other question, actually, from one of the fans on Twitter. So Dave Ross, um, he went to the night where you and Gary Crowley had a lovely conversation. Sadly, I missed this because I, I love Gary. He's, he's absolute legend and he's been on the podcast. He's brilliant. Legend, what a, lovely man. What a fella. But he said it was a great night out. And as always, Nick was full of great stories. Ask him about his first interview with Adrian Thrills and you won't be disappointed with the story. Oh, <laughs> so, so sorry to get you to just, just, just to tell a story, man. But this is apparently this is well worth it, folks. <laughs> I used to work in Great Marble Street in House of Wizard, the commercial art company. That's when we lived above a flower shop in Kensington and Gloucester Road. And so I'd go to work. And I just, I, I thought, well, the new Musical Express is in Carnaby Street. Well, that's really close. You know, so lunchtime, I just thought, I'll get off a little bit earlier so not everybody's out to lunch in the NME. And I'm just going to go there. So I walked it, I was, because I used to walk past all the time, you know, because I'd always go to Carnaby Street just to walk up and down anyway. You know, when you could, you don't need to cut through Carnaby Street, but you just go, I'm going to go through Carnaby Street. Because I've walked up and down Carnaby Street with my mum many a time, you know, getting Lord Kitchener shirts, t shirts, making bacon, <laughs> you know, flared sleeves like this. So I was walking and I just thought, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do, I'm going in. I'm, I'm, I'm shit, I'm, I'm walking into the enemy. Oh, going up the stairs, I'm going in, and I walked in, and it was just like, oh, my God, there's office, there's desks everywhere. Oh, this is too real. And I went, that's the guy from the specials documentary, the Scar documentary. That's, you know, that. oh, my, that's the picture I reckon the singles reviews, you know. That, <laughs> that's Adrian Thrilled. I, I sat down, and it's kind of like that thing of, Oh, yeah, can I help you kind of thing? I said, yeah, I'm uh, I'm from a band, you know, and as you can see his face, you know. <laughs> yeah. you know and I had his oh, music God, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I said, I said, we're, we're called Haircut 100. <laughs> and you could just tell just from that. That's how important a name is. Because I don't think he kicked me out because it's just like, what? <laughs> you know, it's, that, it's that thing of why, what, Haircut 100? I gave him a tape, um, which had a load of jamming on it because we we did a, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the tape was not very good. And he laughs about it because, you know, he played it and it was just like, hold on a minute, what's this? There's just like, <laughs> over it and stuff. It's like a sort of jazz thing. We were just going like a Gary Burton thing. And I was going, oh, let me read my poem. Yeah. And, and Graham's going, yeah, yeah. It's a, we just kind of, this was with this bottle. He was banging this bottle. And, <laughs> is this one of the bonus tracks on the box set? <laughs> I can get hold of that. It is It is around. Um, we got a load of demos somehow up here through not such great experiences. I think somebody died, you know, and their garage kind of got given to eBay. And then it was just, a, oh, like, there they are, you know. We had somebody, Dave Bottrell, who just used to just collect our stuff. I mean, he he loved the band so much and ended up managing me for a while. And he's, he's, he's a lo- lovely guy. And, yeah, he's not not with us now. But anyway, I, I, I digress. Adrian sat down. And then 
from that, he came around with a guy with a camera to our flat above the florists, above the flower shop, took some pictures, had a little chat, and we just thought that wasn't an interview or anything. Anyway, it appeared in the enemy as a half page spread, and that was that was it. <laughs> But that was the moment. That was like the change from then. That's the moment. It literally went like suddenly like this. We, we played at, up the road at the college, and that's where Chris Parry couldn't get in. The place was round, and we were supporting a band called the Tropicanos, who were kind of Calypso band, and Lascelles and Herschel in the brass section ended up being in our brass from that gig. They were in the band, and, and they were kind of going, you know, you guys – you got a lot of fans. <laughs> <laughs> that thing of the power of the music press as well, just that one thing in NME and suddenly it takes off. Yeah. Honestly, any young bands looking at listening to this is like bold move. Yeah. But if you think this was this kind of the contradiction between being insecure and bold at the same time. You know, it's those things of bold moves can bring amazing results and magical stuff you just got to make the move on that yeah yeah that's fabulous man hey look nick i've loved love love chatting with you good luck with everything that's happening right now having the band back deserve all this success man it's gonna be really exciting to see what's next and a new material i'm sure will be talked about at some point as, as well right i don't see why a haircut 100 can't have a number one album again because we didn't do it last time it, number two right i think got the gym kept sort of <laughs> <laughs> I have two final questions for you before you go, Nick. Okay, so you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be The Jam, The Star Council, or it can be Paul Weller solo. What are you going to go with? I think In the City. What yeah. a song. It's still, you know, da, 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 da. oh no, this is the modern world. <laughs> <laughs> He's not even a fan, folks. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> if I had time to think about it, I'd probably come up with a long list and I'd go through it many times and I'd come up with one. I must say, right from the early things, away from the numbers really resonated. That was the, my poor, my, that's where I fell in love, away from the numbers. That was the one that Russell chose, I think, Russell Hastings. Really? Yeah. Maybe it's everybody's first port of call because it's, it's, so, it's so soft for them as well because it was, a, like a, it was like the strawberry jam in a donut, that moment, in this, in this album. You know, because you said stuff that went like the clappers, like art school and things, you know. And Batman and all that, yeah. I, I loved it. It was For me, it was just like this was pop art at its best, you know. Because um, when, I, when I got into The Who, they'd already stopped being what I liked about them, you know, because I, I felt like it was still pop art when they were doing I Can See For Miles and stuff and, and the whole kind of Tommy thing I loved. And it used to be in the beans and everywhere. And it's just like, wow, this is, this is it. I mean, I, you know, I, I had a can of baked beans on the sleeve of in the 90s, but just purely because of that. It was baked <laughs> beans means pop. That's what it is. It's, it's pop. Is that why you wrote the song, Baked Beans, because of that? <laughs> Probably. You know, I mean, I, I wanted I, I was just such a fan of pop art. And it was just like, here's a song. And it's called Baked Beans. And the fact that it was called Baked Bean really, really, really messed Have me. you corrected that on the reissue? Yes. Yeah. It's plural. <laughs> it's plural. It's, it's what it was meant to be. It was a typo all those years. It was, I just thought, Baked Bean. Oh, my God. <laughs> so wrong. There's not a song called Baked Bean. Whoa, it's <laughs> Baked Beans. It's not pop art. It's not one. It's not one Baked Bean. It's thousands of the fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nick, final one question. Baked bean. <laughs> one one baked bean. No. no. Yeah. no. <laughs> That's what? not a meal. No. <laughs> final question, right? So the purpose of this podcast is to meet amazing people like yourself who love the well of music, the jam, the style counts or whatever, and have all these connections. But really, it's to dig into your career, hear your story as well. So I love this. But it's for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed in my radio career, right? So if it happens at the end of this podcast, series nick what should i ask him what would you like to know mm, okay dan what would you ask paul uh why he was on the front of the enemy once with paint and hardly any clothes on did you remember, <laughs> that? remember that look it looked like, that was the topless one right where he was in the yeah, woods with yeah, the bow and arrow he, he had a bit of a loincloth going i mean maybe you'd seen the love plus one video i don't know uh, <laughs> i'd ask him what that was all about really <laughs> what, what was all that about then paul you know, because he never, I never knew. And maybe I should read the article. You know, it'll, it'll come, become clearer what that was all about. 
I wonder who persuaded him to take those shots. I'd have to have a look and see who yeah. the photographer was I mean, and find out. This is the guy that won't do jam songs. <laughs> this is the guy that won't do... I mean, there's no moving him on certain issues. It's just like, no, you know, and that is it. And yet, look at that. You know, he's really pushed the boat out as far as um, some fashion decisions. Of- <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Nick, thank you so much for your time, man. I love chatting with you. Cheers thank for joining you, me. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. And, you know, love to all the Jam fans out there, you know, like, respect. Love, love, love that. What a lovely fella. Nick Haywood, so many amazing stories and what a love of the jam and Mr. Weller as well. So many nice connections in that episode. And I should say thank you so much to Nicky Weller for putting me in touch with Nick and sourcing out that connection. Much, much, much appreciated, Nicky. Thank you so much for listening. Do check out the show notes to this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Whilst you're there, you can get yourself a virtual coffee in our store, which gets you a shout out on the podcast as well. Hello to Steve Perry who has done that in the past week. Andy Tolcher, hi to you. Also, Martin Morrow, thank you to you, sir, for your support. Brian G, Alex McLaughlin, who says, really enjoyed the chat with Suad Massey, another artist on the podcast that I wasn't aware of. I've enjoyed finding her music this week. Well, thank you, Alex. Hello to Steve Perry. Hi to Mike Steer. Smeg from the 829 Club. Hello, hello. Hi also to Jen. Stephen Cartwright, Stu Burns, Colin, Jane the Jam Tart with a Heart, Nick Keane, and Roger Clark. Thanks to you for all your support on your subscriptions. Keep them coming. PaulWellerFanPodcast.com. Thanks for all your support, as I say. Get in touch on social media at WellerFanPod on Twitter or on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.